project started in 2018 and I think the trust was approached in about May of that year. Um, and the idea was to bring together lots of different specialities who are providing um, really quite well, quite complex treatments. So there was um, TAVI, there was dialysis, and we formed part of the chemotherapy arm. And so we started collecting data in November of 2018. And this was all data from patients who, had, who have lung cancer. So as soon, the idea was that is, as soon as they were going to be going for chemotherapy, we would give them a frailty score, but we quickly decided that it would be best if everyone was assigned a frailty score as soon as they were suspected as having lung cancer. And then over time, the core group who is made up of lots of different people, so there's myself as lead HP, there's Alistair, um, who's project managing alongside David Shaw, she was one of our um, nurses by background. We also have a data manager, a respiratory physician, we have a clinical nurse specialist, and all of us have come together with our expertise to see how best to use the scale um, and at what points during the, the patient journey that it should be repeated. Do you have anything to add to that, Alistair? Well, so I think it's important that when we're talking about frailty scales, we should be very clear because there's a number of scales out there. Some have been used in cancer patients and some have not. So uh, the basis behind this project was to use a frailty score that was already being used in the NHS in older patients and had been validated uh, extensively uh, in older patients without cancer to show prognosis and how they got out of hospital and discharge destination and to assess its utility in cancer. So th this is a very simple scoring system. You can be trained in about five or 10 minutes. There's an app, it's called the Rockwood Clinical Frailty Scale. And so we wanted to assess its utility. And as Jenny said, we started off in the lung cancer outpatient setting, but it was very quickly apparent to us that it could be useful in the inpatient setting, uh, both in the initial assessment and we were seeing patients deteriorating over time and that being reflected in the frailty scale. Um, so Jenny and her team have done a huge piece of work looking at the utility of this scale um, in the inpatient setting. We've also done a lot of work in the outpatient setting, but, but this presentation was on the inpatient setting uh, across a range of tumor types, not just lung cancer, not only solid tumors, but hematology as well, hematological malignancies. And uh, as I'm sure she'll tell you, it, it's been shown to be really quite useful and that's what we'll be presenting data on. The frailty scale itself is shown that it is prognostic in terms of survival. And I guess in terms of as a therapy team, as physiotherapists and occupational therapists, we've known this for a long time. So we've seen on the wards in particular that as people's function starts to change, then their period of time towards the end of their life is very, very short. Um, some of the um, malignancies that, that we see, um, particularly, particularly the lung cancers, certainly some of the um, hematology patients with CNS disease, we do tend to see a more rapid deterioration. So when they are starting to score around about the six mark, so when they're starting to become moderately frail, that's the time when, when we feel as therapists that we really need to start making um, moves to start future planning conversations at around about that point. So I guess the, the, the score itself has been really useful because it's now providing data to all of the MDT that, that backs up what, we, what we've been seeing for a long time. Um, and I think that in terms of, of the frailty score and the use of it, as Alistair was saying before, it is so quick to use. And on a two weekly basis now, we are repeating that score as a therapy team. And we set time aside um, on Tuesday mornings to do that. And we will be doing that for the foreseeable future so that we can capture more data. Um, so I'm sure um, Alistair can talk more about the, the data that we've collected and the analysis of that. Um, but moving forward, since this presentation has been done, I think we're close to collecting a further 150 scores um, in, in repeated measures in, within both haematology and oncology. Yeah, you know, I think um, 
Ginny's right in terms of, uh, so she discussed it being prognostic. So one of the things, the first things we looked at was just impact on survival. And the score starts at one and goes all the way up to, to eight. In fact, it's, there's a nine in the formal score, but the nine is anyone that's got a terminal uh, terminal diagnosis. So almost all patients with cancer would score on that. So we took the nine out of it. So we only use one to eight. And in the inpatient setting, we basically didn't see anyone that had one or two uh, scores. But um, as you went from three to four to five to six, the prognosis got worse and worse. And by the time you're getting to six, seven, eight, as Jenny said, um, these patients tended to have very low, low survival. And, and that, that was true um, both in hematological patients and in solid tumors, although the hematology patients did have a slightly better prognosis than those patients with solid tumors. But within the hematology setting, um, the score was definitely, definitely prognostic. And the other thing that was interesting to our mind, and um, we thought was going to be true, but has been shown in, in terms of the analysis, is the score had only originally been derived in patients over 65. Now, um, about just over a third of our patients were under 65, but it, it was equally prognostic in that group. So it could still give really valuable information, even in the patients who are under 65. I was going to say, in terms of, um, in terms of frailty, the the whole thing of age i think as as therapists we are we, of course we pay very close attention to age but so if we have an 82 year old that that will pique our interest even on a handover but we are seeing patients who are in their 20s who are very very frail and obviously there's a great deal of discussion about giving those patients a lot of treatment quite quite, quite right but we are looking at function and it's a very objective thing to look at that um, rather than rather than age so uh, as Alistair was saying yes the, the tool was originally for, for 65 and over but it has real utility across across all ages and that was actually the point I was uh, I was I was going to chime in but it's great that Jenny brought it through first is that um, as an oncologist, we often have to make difficult decisions um, when patients are admitted uh, to hospital with symptoms derived from their cancer as to whether they will derive benefit from further systemic treatment or sometimes radiotherapy. And those can be very challenging decisions to make and, and very challenging conversations to have with patients and their family members about the pros and cons of uh, future treatment and whether we will be able to reverse their decline. And this is an extra tool that we can use in those discussions, um, both as team members, um, but also when we're talking to the family and to the patient about how they wish to proceed uh, to, gu to help guide those decisions. It's not a be on or end all, but it's an informative tool. We have a draft manuscript in publication. The last final bit of analysis that I am... Um, I was hoping to do this week before this interview, uh, but uh, clinical work at the moment with COVID-19 is very busy. Um, but uh, obviously the, the standard tool at the present on, in oncology is performance status. And our feeling at present time is that certainly in the inpatient setting, this can outperform performance status. Performance status is very difficult to judge in hospital setting, particularly in the inpatient setting, where trying to judge how much time patients are spending in, in, in a chair or a bed, which is how you, you judge performance status, can be very difficult. Um, so we've now collected all the performance status data on these patients as well, which did take a bit of time. And uh, the final bit of analysis I'm gonna do is to show, it is to look to see which is better or which gives the most information, performance status, frailty scale, or I suspect it's probably going to be a combination of the two. Um, as soon as I've finished that analysis, uh, we will be looking to publish this data and share our experiences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but as I was saying before, we are hoping to, to answer your question, we are hoping to, to continue um, to collect that data um, moving forward because we do think that it, it, it's really useful. So what we've seen in the UK is there's select centres that are doing a lot of this work and we're starting to work together. And uh, Fabio Gomez at the Christie just last week published a survey of what's going on in the UK in this area. And there's really good pockets of both research and practice in this area. But we really need this to be taken on nationwide if we're going to improve the care of patients with cancer. This is a very cheap and easy tool to use and it but can make a real difference in how we manage our patients with cancer. Um, along with some of the other uh, things we're using, like um, implementation of oncogeriatric pathways um, and prehabilitation 
and exercise programs. Um, so I'm, I'm really hopeful that the people with the money in NHS England look at this work and think that this is something that could be taken forward and actually provide added value to our healthcare system. Mm. And I think as well, one of the things that we are really interested in is um, dis decision support clinics that have obviously various different names. But it would be really interesting to see a, a nationwide piece of work on the benefits of those clinics. And I think in Newcastle, certainly we, we would be really keen to, to all merge together as oncologists and you know specialist physicians occupational therapists physiotherapists dietitians palliative care to make sure that we're coming to the right decisions for these patients um, and i would be really interested to see a piece of work done done on that nationally <laughs>